more so this Sunday uh, as we gather. I, I, I feel like we need to be reminded of why we are here. Why, why, are, why do we gather on Sunday? This is a, a beautiful rainy day that we could be home, right? Drinking tea or coffee on the porch, listening to the rain, journaling, reading a book, just having our own time by ourselves. But yet we climb out of bed, we put on clothes, we walk to our car in the rain or wherever, some of us through mud, and, and we came here. Let me just hear from you guys. Why are you here? Go ahead. Just shout it out. And I'll, I'll, but give me time to repeat it so the people who are alive can, can hear. She, Callie's here because she likes us all. Even me? <laughs> nice. Oh, thanks, love. That's true. I mean, we, there's that brotherly affection that, that Peter talks about, you know, again, being dear to one another. And Paul says, you, you've become dear to me. Yeah, I, I'm glad. I'm glad to hear that. Anybody else? Why, why, why are you here this morning? To praise God. To, to praise, praise God. God. Yeah. And to praise God if, around other people. It's good to see other people praising God with us. I mean, you, we could do that on our own. We could go out in the woods and praise God. But is it not encouraging? Is it not uplifting to see other people doing it with you? It is for me. It reminds me, like, like, like a Elijah, you know, I'm the only one. No, you're not. <laughs> We've got a remnant of people. Yeah, we get to see we're not alone. We're here together in this. Anybody else? Why are you here? To learn? Yeah, yeah, I think this is a great. We can learn from each other. Anybody else? It's a command. What do you mean? I'm exercising my freedom, man. Don't command me. <laughs> no, I know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't forsake. When it says don't forsake the assembling of, uh, of yourselves, it's talking about uh, like, just don't take it for granted. Don't, don't think it's something that's not that important. When you have opportunity and you're able to, do it. Exercise. Get to be with people. It's valuable. Absolutely. Anybody else? We're going to wrap it up. Now, if you guys are, are live and you're, you're, you're asking yourself, too, why am I up? I could be sleeping in. Uh, but, but you're here and you're tuning in. Text it. Just, just put a message in there. Why are you here? Answer the question. We'd love to see you guys and, and know why you're watching us, why you've joined us uh, this morning. Anybody else? I'm here because I, 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 I feel like I want to draw near. And, and, and there really is something, uh, uh, draw near to the Lord. There really is something, like, like, like Chris said, about drawing near with other people. It's, it's, it's a different experience. It's, it's needed. I mean, I have my time when it's just me and the Lord, and, and that's needed as well. But there's another time when it's me and other people, and it's, it's just as sweet, and it's just as needed, and yet, yet it's different. It, and so I, I, I'm here for that. I'm, I'm excited. to. We need Jesus. We need him. So uh, what, what I could do this morning is, is just give you an idea. This is what we're going to do. <laughs> this is what you guys can expect. We're going to sing some songs. Uh, Kevin and the worship team have, have prayerfully considered these after looking at the passage and talking about uh, just, just where it is the Lord is leading us. They've got some songs for us to sing. We're going to continue on through 1 Peter. Anybody know what chapter we're in this morning? Four? <laughs> Stop throwing gang signs. This, this was my gang sign in, in, in high school, just for you know. Anyways. Um, and then we're going to have some time in prayer. Now, I know some of the kids are really, really excited to hear who wins the drawing, the com free community library contest. You guys, it's not really wins, but, but they uh, uh, were selecting one of the kids' drawings, uh, one of their, their descriptions of a community library that we will then, uh, after I select the two winners, we're gonna, the kids are going to get together, and they're going to build them, paint them, fill them, and install them, one inside or, or out front of here. And one inside, or I keep saying inside, outside of uh, the all-natural food store. Uh, and it's going to be a, just a way we can put resources out. We can even put snacks and give out free food for people who might want it. Um, however, <laughs> I need more time. 
I, I've had, I think, seven submissions, and they're all really good. I have some questions. I need to ask some people about their drawings. Um, so I had said that I would announce which ones we're going with, but I apologize. I can't do that right now. So I'm sorry. Just next week. So All right. Any other announcements? Let me just, just take care of this right now. Can you guys think of announcements? The ladies' Bible study is continuing on at 6 o'clock. Uh, what, are you guys meeting tomorrow night? Yes? 6 p.m. tomorrow night, the ladies' Bible study college group. We are meeting Wednesday at 7 o'clock. Um, I've been so amazed. I, I'm, I, hope you, uh, I think you guys are too. How many visitors? Every week we've had like three visitors. It's so neat. Now it's like to get them all back, <laughs> you know, all at once. That'd be really cool. Um, but yeah, I, I've, I've been so blessed by it. So uh, the, the, the Wednesday night Bible study uh, at 7 o'clock. So there's another announcement. Misty, I, I, I could really use some help on this. I forgot, uh, but we're going to be doing something in the community. It was her idea, and I thought it was a great idea. Um, on Halloween, the community is doing their thing where people, like kids are dressing up. You know, we're not celebrating that. We're not, we're not engaging in that. But the people in the community will be out. And it's a great opportunity for us to meet the community. You know, why would we, why would we pass on an opportunity to meet the community? So they're going to be out, and we've got some tracks, uh, some, some gospel presentations, uh, and, and, and we're going to hand out some candy. They're going to be going the route, so the, 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 the kids and the parents are going to be driving around. All these different businesses and locations uh, are, are going to be participating. So I know they're leaving, after they leave the Christian church, we're going we're gonna to direct them, and they're going to come down this road, and we're going to uh, hand out candy uh, and gospel tracks. So uh, for everyone who's interested, uh, hopefully conversations will develop. We get to talk to people. Um, I don't think like any of us are, are, are dressing up for it, but we are going to be there, and we want to meet our neighbors. We want to meet our community. So, Misty, if there's anything else that we need to know, um, not necessarily putting you in charge of this, but uh, you had a lot of insight onto this, um, so you let us know. Uh, just put it in the type, uh, in the comments, or, or send Chris a message. He could tell me. So that's, I think, Saturday, the th actually on Halloween the 31st. I don't even know what time it is. It's going to be like probably 5 o'clock, I imagine. That's usually when the city does stuff for kids, a little earlier. So uh, so we do need candy, though. If you guys have candy or gospel presentations, especially if they're related to, like, spooky or Halloween, they really talk to it, you know, the meaning of Halloween and the background to it, and then the gospel. If you have anything like that, that'd be an awesome resource. You could bring it in, and we'll, we'll pass it out. So any other announcements, guys? Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Thank you for saying that. We, we, we put it out in our back channels. Uh, tonight are, has been canceled. Uh, the, the rain uh, and, and, and something else, actually, uh, that, that I can't share right now, has been um, canceled all events, actually, at that location. For, so we're, we're, I put this out in our back channels, but if you guys are watching us and, and you hadn't heard our uh, grill out that we were going to be doing tonight, uh, down at the Salvation Army Camp Paradise Valley uh, has been canceled. Uh, so we'll try and figure out what else we could do uh, some other time, hopefully soon. The weather is going to probably hold us back. And then having to meet indoors is going to hold us back. Uh, the whole point of that was being outdoors. So thank you. Thank you for bringing that up. All right, I love you guys. So that's enough announcements. Let's just let's pray. Musicians, come on, on up. Father, we need you. Uh, and again, this is why we're here, for you. So we thank you, Lord, for helping us just get through... Uh, the administration of, of our gathering and the, and the communication that is needed to, to keep everybody in the loop. But, Lord, now we just we want to communicate with you. We want to hear from you. We want you to draw us in your presence. So, Lord, we pray against distractions of, of plans for this afternoon, against anything else, Lord, that might just keep us in our heart, Lord, uh, away from you and, and reserved. Lord, help us abandon and just run to you with full trust and hope, Lord, that you are what we need. Jesus, you are so good. We ask, Lord, as we sing songs about you, that, you, that just the thought of you and the mention of your name would be like honey on our lips. Lord, be our desire, be our focus, our, our life's treasure, worth of all of our pursuit. Lord, you alone are worthy. So, Lord, we want to make much of you, Jesus. It's all for your beautiful, worthy glory we do this. And for our benefit, we pray. Amen. Will you guys stand? Let's, let's, let's sing some songs.
So thinking about Kellis's question a while ago, why are we here? I was thinking um, just recently there was two, three months when we couldn't be here, right? And so that just underscores the privilege we have of being here. And, and we can talk about how, you know, gathering in America is a, is a right, but man, what does that even mean anymore? Uh, but it's a privilege and we have it. Um, so for this time, let's, let's be together and let's worship together.
running this next song earlier, it, it it occurred to me how much this is a declaration. This isn't just saying I'm no longer a slave. This is declaring I'm no longer a slave. And if you think back a few weeks ago in First Peter, um, he's talking about how we should live as slaves if we're slaves. Um, but we also know that we, we're told that we're no longer slaves and that Jesus causes his friends. So, you know, whatever state we're in, be content. But 
what a gift this morning to be able to declare this, that we're no longer slaves, that we're, we're children of, of a holy God. Um, so if you want to sing this at the top of your lungs, if you want to scream it, if you want to pump your fist, uh, I think that's kind of the spirit of the song is just declaring that we're no longer slaves. Oh 
Father God, we thank you for your grace, Lord, and that while we were sinners and so unworthy, God, you died for us, Lord. You gave us the precious gift of salvation. Um, God, help us to always be grateful. Help us to always be thankful. And uh, Lord, we just give you this time. We ask that you would speak to us and Open our ears, open our hearts, and uh, we just thank you for your word. And 
thank you for all we have in Christ's name. Amen. Morning. Wait to open your Bibles to First Peter chapter four. Starting in verse one. Therefore, since Christ has suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same purpose, because he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin so as to live the rest of the time in the flesh, no longer for the lusts of men, but for the will of God. For the time already past is sufficient for you to have carried out the desire of the Gentiles, having pursued a course of sensuality, lusts, drunkenness, carousing, drinking parties, and abominable idolatries. In all this, they were surprised that you do not run with them into the same excesses of dissipation, and they malign you, but they will give account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. For the gospel has for this purpose been preached even to those who are dead, that though they are judged in the flesh as men, they may live in the spirit according to the will of God. For the end of all things is near, therefore be of sound judgment and sober spirit for the purpose of prayer. Above all, keep fervent in your love for one another, because love covers a multitude of sins. Be hospitable to one another without complaint. As each one has received a special gift, employ it in serving one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Whoever speaks is to do so as one who is speaking the utterances of God. Whoever serves is to do so as one who is serving by the strength which God supplies, so that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belong the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Thank you, Chris. I'm not sure if you guys knew this. I was born and raised in California. I was born in San Diego. I think when I was three, maybe four, we moved up to Northern California, the Bay Area. I lived up there uh, all the way through high school and then moved down back to San Diego. Uh, I stayed there for, I guess, the first 10 years of my adulthood. Met Callie. We got married, had Kennedy. Uh, for like about 10 years or so before the Lord called us out here to Kentucky. So my first 27 years uh, were in California. And, and think about San Diego, which uh, I would still refer to as a, as a place I call home. A lot of all my family is still there. But, but one of the things that we would love doing is going out down to the bay. Uh, it, there's bays and oceans there. <laughs> We'd go down to the bay, San Diego Bay, the harbor, and we would see all the boats, all the ships that were coming in. Now, San Diego is a naval just hub. There's, there's huge bases, both uh, all sorts of military, but uh, Navy and, and, and Marines. And down in, in the San Diego Bay, there's a, a naval station there. We just called it 32nd Street. <laughs> I don't know what else, what it was really called. But anyways, they would have uh, aircraft carriers. Uh, even there was one time we w- were able to go out on like a family cruise uh, and where they uh, 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 invited uh, just regular citizens and civilians to go out on this Aegis missile, guided missile cruiser. I think that's, anyways, it's called the Mobile Bay. And they would go out like a few miles and they would do like a shooting and just a demonstration. It was, it was really neat being on the, the, this, this, this cruiser, this battleship. No, it's not a battleship, but you know, this ship for battle. But also what struck me though, in the San Diego Bay, like with all the aircraft carriers and the other, uh, different military ships, there was also a hub for cruises, lots of them constantly coming in. 
You just uh, imagine walking down to the harbor with me, just whatever you can do. Maybe you've seen it and you can have it in your mind. You walk down and you're in the harbor and you see two ships there side by side. One is a cruise ship. One is a battleship. Just imagine now all the attitudes and the, the expectations and the emotions that are just, just getting uh, are stirring in people who are about to board these two ships. Just consider how different they would be. I don't know if you guys have ever been on a cruise ship. I don't think I ever will be. Callie is hyper claustrophobic. I'm sure she's freaking out even mentioning it, just the thought of it. But just imagine just like the, the excitement about to board, go on a cruise. Imagine now the excitement. I'm about, to, or, 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 or really the, uh, <laughs> Not, not, not so much fear, but just the, the dread. I'm about to go on a battleship. I'm about to be gone from my family for months, possibly. Who knows? It's just the, the, the stark differences. Now, just imagine now that you got somebody who, who is coming down, and they think they, they're boarding a cruise ship, but they actually board the battleship. So they get on there, just imagine now I'll get all these emotions and expectations. They're excited. I'm about to get my whatever on. <laughs> I don't know what they do on a cruise ships. So I don't think I want to know. So, so imagine though, so he goes now, he goes to his room. And he sees his room and he's like, <laughs> is this where I'm supposed to be? Something's off. This does not look like the brochure. <laughs> And then he's going around, and, he, and he's, like, trying to find the pool. He's trying to find the, t- the tub. He's trying to find the buffet. So things are really confusing. What is this place? Where's Disney? Where's Mickey Mouse? I want to see. Goofy. None of this is making sense. Now imagine how confused and, and, and just bewildered he is. People start shooting at them. What kind of cruise is this? <laughs> I'm not paying for this. I didn't sign up for this. Drop me off, they would say. I just imagine that. Huge, stark differences. And yet, sadly, for so many Christians, this is their experience, isn't it? When they heard the gospel, somebody portrayed it in such a way where it really sounded, it was explained it, uh, as if they were, they were signing up, they were about to go on the love boat, on a cruise ship. It's going to be great wealth and and health, and prosperity. Why wouldn't I join up for this? This is everything you said I've, I've longed for. Well, I've longed for a better job. I've been longing for a nicer car. I've been, I want better health. Okay, yeah, I'll sign up for that. But over time, obviously, it's not very true. And all these things aren't working out. Sometimes health continues to decline. You never get a new car. <laughs> you got passed up for promotion again. And so people become confused and they become discouraged and they're hurt. And sadly for so many, they, they just, they just want to walk away. I don't want any of this. Why would anyone come here on this beautiful rainy day when they got a porch and a hot cup of tea, you know, The New Testament couldn't be clearer, though. This is a spiritual battle. Following hard after Jesus, continuing on in this life, this Christian life, is a spiritual battle. Just just say that word with me. It's a battle. Everybody say battle. Everybody say war. All the metaphors... That, that describe the Christian life in the New Testament, by far the majority of them are military metaphors. By far. Peter tells us as Christians, we should arm ourselves for battle. What does he mean by that? Peter is saying, arm yourselves for battle. What does he mean by that? That's what I want to talk about this morning. Because again, if you have your Bible, turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 4. And if you're visiting us, we've been working through First Peter. We are now in chapter 4. And there's a lot of 
uh, things that he has said in the past. He's going he's to recycle that, that language. He's going to use it again. I'll do my best to kind of point out where he first said that, kind of what he meant. But really, you might have to just go back and, and, and read First Peter, all of it. But maybe just go back and listen to some of these sermons. You, you can find them online. But as we see again in chapter 4, Peter has reminded us that we often suffer for the sake of righteousness, but we are blessed because we have experienced the salvation through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. We're blessed. We may suffer persecution. We may suffer unfair treatment. Terrible unfair treatment, maybe even. But we are blessed because of the resurrection of, of Jesus Christ. So no matter what happens in the world, all, the future is full of hope for those who have put their trust in Jesus Christ. I say this a, a, a lot. As Christians, we may have 99 problems, but eternity is not one. That is not our problem. It is secure in and, 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 and comparison to all of eternity. Life is just pales in comparison. Whatever life, whatever other problem c- could come up, pales in comparison to eternity. And so, so we just remember, even in the most difficult moments, Peter is saying that we, we are blessed. And so and he says now, in chapter 4, verse 1, Therefore, so that's in, in light of this truth, because we are blessed no matter what comes against us, no matter how bad it gets, since Christ has suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same purpose, because he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. So as to live the rest of this time in the flesh, no longer for the lust of men, but for the will of God. Okay, so, since Christ has suffered in the flesh. And that, that's just, again, a review of this previous chapters. That at one point, God stepped out of, of, of the heavens, again, revealing himself, coming into the box, language from our Wednesday night coming into the box, coming into the world, God stepped into the world to be with creation and, and, and flesh so that we could see Him and know Him, hear Him, touch Him. And yet the world responded by abusing Him and rejecting this Creator. And ultimately He was crucified. And so He says, because that's true, since Christ suffered in the flesh, Arm yourselves with the same purpose. The idea of, of, of arming yourselves, again, it's on the military term. It's, it's saying, strap on the weapon. But, it, but in the sense that it's go time. Like, it's going down. Get the weapon on, but not, not just like this concealed carry type of fashion. Like, or I may have to have it. I need to be ready in season and out of season because you never know. There might be a bad guy. No, in the sense where it's, it's going down. You need that. Get it out. Put one in the chamber. Like, like, like you're in the heat of it. It's go time. So that's the idea. Arm yourselves with this purpose. I mean, if you are identifying yourself as a Christ follower. You are being attacked I think so often we say, like, like you, you will face persecution. You may face attack. No, you are being attacked. It's go time. Peter is saying that. There's so much urgency in this. So if you want to be a Christ follower, if you want to be faithful to the mission, if you want to pursue him and advance his kingdom, fulfill your calling, they abused him, they will, they are abusing you. You've got to arm yourself and realize you are in battle. You may not just go to battle sometime. You are in battle. Everybody say in battle. Everybody say in war. So when he says, he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. Peter, cons- again, he's consistently using this idea of suffering in the flesh, referring to the, the crucifixion. So he's talking about those of us who are Christians, we identify with Christ. That means we are identifying with the crucifixion, with his death. We're saying, I, I, essentially, I, I, I'm dying. I have, I have crucified my selfish desires. That's temptation to be my own God. I've crucified, I've killed it, and I'm alive to Christ, to God, for his purposes and his, his will. 
So, so I've ceased from sin is what it's saying. Now the verb tense here matters. I've heard this passage again used to beat people up. And it, it's not that simple. It, it's not saying that at this moment I will never sin again. And so you're only a true Christian if you have ceased from sin. You are never, you never to sin again. And again, we use this to beat people up and show them, you know, like, you're not as good as me. That's not, that's not what it's saying. I wish that were true. I wish I never sinned again. I wish since I, since I became a follower of Christ, I wish so many things I regret. So many people that I've hurt since then. So many times I've, I, I, I've probably ruined testimony. And I'm sorry. I blew it. I wish that were true. But what it's saying, though, is, is since it's in the past tense, it means has ceased. It's meaning that something has happened in the past at a moment, but it, it is having ongoing effects. And as we grow in Christ, we understand this and we learn this, we see this. So essentially, though, at, at the moment I trusted Christ as my Savior, for me, that's like 16, 17 years ago, I identified that he died my death. I identified with that and I accepted that. So I died now to the condemnation of sin, Romans chapter 8, verse 1. There's no more condemnation for those who are in Christ. I died to the punishment of my sin. I died to the bondage of my sin. I no longer have to live that way. The old man is dead. I'm, I'm free now to marry another, Romans talks about. This, all these beautiful analogies and pictures were like, I'm free now. To present my body as a slave to righteousness. I'm no longer a slave to unrighteousness. Now stuck. I've been bought. I've been purchased out of that. And now I'm free to pursue righteousness. To pursue Jesus and holiness. So that's, that, that's really what it's talking about. We, we, we are, are, are dead to or we've been crucified, we, we've ceased from, from the bondage and the slavery and the condemnation. Really, really, if you guys remember our previous studies, we are f- set free from the dark room. We're out of there. The door has been opened. And any time you spend in the dark room, it, it, it's, <laughs> it's really stupid, but it, you're there holding yourself there. Nothing else. That you're, God has opened the door and allowed you to go to the light anytime, as soon as you're ready. So verse 3 says, For the time already past is sufficient for you to have carried out the desire of the Gentiles. Gentiles means here like like pagans and unbelievers. He kind of switched it on us. Paul did this too. We're no longer like uh, uh, an ethnicity. It's really really just those who are in Christ and those who who are outside of that, unbelievers. So having pursued a course of sensuality, lust, drunkenness, carousing, drinking parties, and abominable idolatries. The language of Peter, guys, is really interesting here. He's basically saying, you've wasted enough of your time. You, I love that, that analogy, Chris, months ago. That we've actually used it several times. There's this long rope, and there's just like a little piece of tape or, or just like a, a, a sliver with a knife taken. You know, just something really, like, Really small. You can barely see even. Now that, that's eternity is this rope. It's supposed to symbolize that. Our life is just like that one little bit. Of, it, it's so brief compared to eternity. You've spent enough time serving the enemy. You've spent enough of this little bit of time that you get here on earth. You've spent enough of it doing these things. You've already wasted enough of your time pursuing these things that don't matter. These things that won't make you happy. Stop it. I talked about this in chapter 1 when he says, at one time before you knew God, you presented your body to these things. You did these things because you didn't know better. But now you know better. You know these things are addictive. You know these things are, are detrimental. They bring shame. They promise pleasure, but they always bring death. You know better. Stop doing these things. It's enough. You've wasted enough of your time. You had an excuse then. There's no excuse now. So Peter is saying you've already wasted enough of your life. And, and again, I feel like there's a sense of urgency in, in this, right? Time is short. What are you doing? Wasting it around. Spending it frivolously. We have a job to do. That's what I love again, about 
our gathering. One, another reason why I like to be here Sunday mornings or just to be in fellowship with people because we all have callings. We all have a purpose and a role to play together. This is, this is God's play. We were talking about this on Wednesday night. We're, we all ha- we're all in this scene of this play together. We all have a script. We all have parts. And without everybody fulfilling their part and going through their script, it doesn't get done. I mean, he's designed it this way. And so I love, I love not only trying to fulfill my role and, and go through my script, but seeing you guys and listening to your script and seeing you fulfill your role. I love it. And I see that Sunday mornings all the time. The people just doing what they do. People helping out here and there. Greeting each other. Talking to each other. Encouraging one another. Cleaning up. Serving behind the scenes in front of the, I mean, just, I love it. I love seeing it. So, you know, the, so we, we have a job to do. Not one more day needs to be wasted. The, I, I, interesting question to wrestle with. Everybody just think on this or write this note. What percentage of your life would you say you have truly lived on mission for the things that ultimately matter forever? What percentage of your life have you actually been on mission don't confuse this with just trying to stay out of trouble and not sin. <laughs> That's the majority of our Christian experience, unfortunately. I'm just trying not to blow it. But, it, but, but actually living on mission. Fulfilling a purpose, a calling. With that mindset, you get the same mindset and expectations as if you were battling, boarding a, a battleship. Every day that you live on mission changes that percentage. Start today. Change that percentage. You can go back and you can't, you can't change the past, but Peter is saying you've wasted a, a, enough of that time with all those things. Let's arm ourselves to be focused on the mission going forward. So verse 4, in all this, they are surprised that you do not run with them into the same excesses of dissipation, and they malign you. So this excesses of dissipation just means, again, more wasted living. It's the same phrase that, that describes the prodigal son. You guys remember them? He just, he just he wanted to go out and just waste everything. Just blow it and have a good time. Frivolous. Just, 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 just go out. He's just wasting his life. But it says, who, who are they that, that, that malign you? Those are the people that we used to run with, that we used to do these things with. At some point, you decided to no longer live that way. You decided, no, I'm going, to, I'm going to pursue righteousness. And that can happen in Christian circles. Again, people in Christian circles are not living, all, not always living on mission. And you decide, I am going to live on mission. You're, you're, you're stepping even out of that Christian circle into, into God's calling and God's purposes. And so you can have that testimony still. But some of us, so it's, it, it is these, these, these drunkenness and all these things, and you, and you decide that I'm not doing those things anymore. I'm pursuing righteousness. And the text says that, that you actually surprise those who you were with, who were around you. I don't like that translation. I, 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 it, it, you can make sense. It, it, it still flows, but you, I, I think better is like they find it strange. They find it strange that you're, that you're doing this. What, what, what's wrong? You've been doing this for years. So like, like, like what, what's the change? What happened? And sometimes, you know, your choice to walk in righteousness, even in a Christian circle, exposes their unrighteousness. Or in the Christian circle, it, it, it would expose their, their apathy. Or it would expose their, just their laziness, their contentment. And sometimes when you expose it, they react to that. When you choose righteousness, it exposes them. And I think a lot of us have had this experience where they look at you and they might even say something like, oh, you're just holier than thou. Who do you think you are? <laughs> One time, and I probably deserved it because I still remember this, but a friend of mine, when I first came to the Lord, I was like, like, my friend was like, who do you think you are, Superman? You know, and, and I just, yeah, I'm still wrestling with that. You know, we got to be careful. Again, meekness is good. We're not going around beating people up with, you know, and, and giving off this attitude. But sometimes, though, I mean, we've experienced this. 
they're, they're going to look at us and they're going to be like, what do you think you're doing? They're going to malign you because you're exposing something and they don't like it. So again, stop think about this. Peter actually heard these words out of the mouth of Jesus. And again, I love knowing that, again, this was Peter who writing this to us. And we know and we can study his experiences with Jesus and we can see sometimes, like, it, I imagine, like Peter uh, heard it from Jesus, he didn't really get it, and now as time has passed and he's, he's in the, the master kind of teacher role, it gets it. I mean, we, we hear our parents say things to us, I don't really get it, whatever, wah, 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 wah. But then when we're parents, oh, I get it. I get it. That's why they said that. That's why they wouldn't let me do that. And I, I, I just I love this, this, that, that picture for me of Peter. So, so he actually heard these things coming out of the mouth of Jesus. Now listen to what Jesus said in, uh, to Peter in John chapter 3. It says, this is the judgment that the light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than the light. Imagine at first Peter was like, okay. <laughs> I'm going to write that down, save it for later. Uh, it says, why? Why? Why, why do they uh, come into the world, and why did men love the darkness rather than the light? It says, for their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light. For fear that his deeds be exposed. Sometimes when we're sharing the gospel, you know, we're, we're ministering to some people, it can be really discouraging that they don't come to Christ right away. And so we start... Unfortunately, sometimes the reaction is, well, just beat them over the head with it until they, you know, until they come. But just, just realize, have some compassion, like, they're working on some stuff. There's some stuff that they're afraid. You're, it's exposing things. They're working through it. The Lord's at work in there. And it's sometimes, it, it just, it just allow the Holy Spirit to do His work. <laughs> but they're fear. They're afraid that their deeds will be exposed. So I think that really it shows us, maybe they don't believe Jesus is safe. Or maybe they don't believe you're safe. So th that's what Peter is saying. You need to understand that when you choose the path of righteousness, you choose to do the right thing, people around you aren't really going li to like it very much. It's going to expose something in them. It's like a flashlight shining on whatever it was they were trying to hide. So just you guys have to accept the fact. And I think a lot of you guys have, but this is this continuing through the text if you're going to walk in the light, you're going to walk according to righteousness. If, you're, if that is something you really are desiring to do, to live with purpose, and from this moment on going forward, you're going to experience battle, spiritual battle. You're not always going to be loved. You're not always going to be accepted. You're not going to be applauded. You're going to be slandered. Really, you're going to be maligned and treated unfairly, but that's part of the cost. That's what he means by arm yourself. Prepare for it. Engage in it. Don't run from it. Verse 5. But they, again, those that slander you, will give account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. And this is a reminder at the end of the history, at the end of, uh, of, this, of his story, at the end of all things, there's only one opinion that matters. This is also again, a reminder that again, vengeance is not ours. It's the Lord's. Everybody's going to have to give an account at the end of the story. Everyone's going to have to, to come before God. And all deeds are going to be judged. So we've, we, again, we've seen this already. He's talked about it. God is opposed to those who do evil. And this is the reason why I don't fight back. I just keep doing what I'm supposed to be doing. I'm going to let God handle the rest. Just keep doing what I'm supposed to be doing. Like, what, what, what does Dory say? Just keep swimming. Just keep swimming. You guys remember that movie? Don't worry about it. Just, just keep going. Just keep going. Ultimately, I get, we understand that at the end of the story, there is one opinion that matters, and it's not my boss. It's not my coworker. It's not your spouse. It's not the people that you find cool and desperately want to please and have their approval. They don't matter. Only God's opinion matters. So Peter told us in chapter 1 that, that you have been born again. Amazing story. I mean, we just, just this idea of being born again. We could spend weeks, months on this. But we've been born again through the grace and mercy of God to a living hope. One that's alive and eternal and, and sure. And it's all based on, on, on Christ and his, his resurrection status. And we've been given this inheritance that, 
That, that again, it, it is not uh, at risk, but it's reserved in heaven where it won't corrupt or go bankrupt. Nobody can change that. Nobody can diminish it. This is amazing just to look forward to that. So the, verse 6, let's just go on. For the gospel has for this purpose been preached even to those who are dead, that though they are judged in the flesh as men, they may live in the spirit according to the will of God. A little confusing, but I think Peter is saying that because we understand that one day every person will stand in judgment before a holy God, we share our faith. Because we understand that the end is coming and everybody is going to stand before God in judgment. We share the good news. The word preached is, is actually often declared or translated, can be translated declare or proclaim good tidings. I, I, I've come that you may have good tidings. You know, just imagine that. It's bringing good tidings, good news. We share the good news because of what we know. I really want you guys to hear this. The word for signifies this, because of what we know. I reject the mandate that some churches and some leaders give to their people to share the gospel out of compulsion. Because it's a command. Go share your gospel. You've been told to do so. Go do your work as an evangelist in the name of God. You know, it's... It's more than that. We don't share our faith because we have to. We share our faith because of what we know. Because we know everybody's going to stand before God. And there is a real punishment and judgment and condemnation. We share it out of love because of what we know. Big difference. As a culture, though, I don't think we, we like this. We, we don't want to talk about stuff like this. We just want to make it go away. We want to just go back to normal. We want to just put our head you know, in the bubble. But Peter is saying that this is why we preach the gospel, because there are, there, there's something at stake. Eternal souls are at stake. If they don't understand the gospel, they don't experience the saving grace of Jesus, it's over for them. They're in, they're in a, a burning building. And we know there is a safe route out. And we want to tell them, get out. Jesus is the door. Go out through Jesus, through Jesus. It brings you to safety. So Peter says that when they were judged by men in the flesh, he's saying that these are, these are people that are on earth. They were, they were judged, I mean, the, the believers, that, that, that men came on them. They, they didn't like what they were doing, and they judged them, and they even executed them, some scholars say. But now at this moment, the moment that Peter is writing this, they are very much alive in the presence of God. Because at the end of the day, again, only God's judgment and verdict matters. Does anyone get the sense that, that there's urgency in what Peter is saying? I mean, I've said a couple times that there's urgency in this, but does anyone else pick it up? Yeah? Do you, do you guys sense it? Do you feel it? At the end of the story, again, again, every single one of us is going to die. We're going to stand before God. That, like, that, maybe, I mean, just, uh, maybe you guys have got it. You've always got it. I, I, I'm being struck by that even more right now as, as we're going through this. There is an urgency to the gospel message. I've had some people say to me that, you know, the world is, again, they're, they're looking for answers, and the church has none. No way. We have the answer, and they need it now more than ever. We have the answer. We've always had the answer, and the answer will never change. It's the gospel. We need, there are people, guys, you work with, the people you go to school with, people that live next to you, stand before, they are going to stand before a, a holy God. And we have the responsibility, there is a responsibility, but it's to steward the good news. It's, it's amoral to not share it. We have the, this message of, God new, uh, of, of good news, this message of salvation, so that these people that are in our lives might experience this salvation and be rescued from this burning building. So verse 7 says, the end of all things is near. Guys, there, there, there's a sense of urgency in these words as well. From, from the ascension of Jesus to, to present day, 
What's what is today? Anybody know the date? Good job. I knew it. I just want to see if you did. Like, like the New Testament has referred to these days as the last days. Sometimes you you, th- you hear people say this. I mean, YouTube videos will, will, will get a thousand clicks if you just put this buzzword in there. Last days. You know, we are living in the last days. Some prophet declares. <laughs> well, I know. <laughs> We've been in the last days. We, we, we've been, I, mean, I know what they mean, the last of the last days, whatever. Like, we are in the last days. We have been, well, we have been living it in the last days our whole life. And then you, New Testament, again, from the ascension of Jesus to the return of Christ, these are all the last days. What's meant by this is that there's nothing else that we're waiting for. Nothing else has to happen or is needed before Jesus comes back. He may come back today. Yeah, that would be so awesome. He may come back tomorrow. It may be 100 years from now. Who knows? There are signs. We can look and see these, these signs. We don't know for sure, but we could, we, we could be looking for them. We could, tend, we could sense it is drawing nearer and nearer and nearer. But again, there's a sense of urgency. There's this realization that we can't waste another day because we don't even know if we have another day. We're in the last days. Nothing else has to happen. Nothing else is needed. He could come at any moment. Therefore, knowing then that Jesus could come back tomorrow at any moment, we have work to do. He says, arm yourselves. Get with it. This is, this is, what, I, this is what I hear. Get with it. How many sermons have been shared over the hundreds of years like this? Get with it. Get with it. I feel like pastors would just keep like, Come on, let's get with it. Let's get with it. Let's get with it. Verse 7. The end of all things is near. Therefore, he says, be of sound judgment. Which just means like right thinking. Be, think, think what is right. And it says, and sober spirit. Which means, again, this clear thinking. I need to be thinking rightly. I need to be thinking clearly. Not, not persuaded with my senses and, and all dulled. But sober. And, and, and all. what is this for? He says, for the purpose of prayer. Literally, it, it, it's plural. This is actually the purpose of prayers. Everybody say, z. <laughs> prayers. So it, it, it's the idea that I'm living in alignment with God and His purpose. Not just one and done, but ongoing, continual. The, so me, I, I'm thinking rightly. I'm thinking clearly. I'm living my life every day accordingly. And it says, above all, keep fervent in your love for one another, because love covers a multitude of sins. Love this passage. Second time, Peter has told us that the, the, the part of, uh, or I guess or the result of, of us being born again is a fervent love for others. That is a sign. When you, if you guys think about the people that you've met, you know, and just like, like you sense there's fellowship of the Spirit. There may be a complete stranger. There's fellowship of the sp- Spirit. We were talking about it at lunch. Remember like a couple weeks ago? Often, like, like for me, it, it's because they just, they love people. They love others. I feel loved. They have fervent love for the brethren. Basically, the idea is, guys, if we're going to ex- experience battle out there, again, think about your context. Where you work, where you go to school, where you live. All the places where the, the battle is raging. If we're going to be in battle out there, we need to have refuge in here. When we gather together in home fellowship, when we gather together you know, a, a, as a church body or wherever it is, we need to have just a place of refuge, a place that is safe. We need a place where we can heal, where we can come and, and we can get fixed and strengthened nourished, encouraged to get right. I, I, idea of love covering a multitude of sins is, is coming from, from Proverbs. It's, that's actually where, where he's pulling that. And it's basically just reminding us that the church is made up of erred people. It, we're, we're made up of humans. I've said this a thousand times. If you ever find a perfect church, don't join it because you're going to ruin it. Because 
we're, we are not perfect. We've got quirks. We've got flaws. We've got hang-ups and hold-ups and ha- habits and all sorts of stuff. And just, I mean, we think about it. We, we, people can be irritable. People can be in a bad mood. They can do hurtful things, sometimes intentionally, sometimes on accident. But we need to d- unite ourselves around the common mission. Again, think about why you are here again this morning. All these reasons that you gave or didn't give. Why you're tuning in with us on Facebook. Is, is, is this part of it? Are, are, are you uniting yourselves with these people in this room with the common mission? We've actually had people over the years that come and they just refuse to unite with the mission. The, 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 there's, this is a place where we are coming, we, we agree with the mission, we are united in this, and we want to go forward like-minded, being faithful to God and His purposes. Yeah, our culture is, is, is basically defined by selfishness, isn't it? Not so much in, in here, like this micro culture, but macro we're defined by self-absorption. People want what they want. And if you don't have what they want, they're going to go find it somewhere else. I get it. There's people who are offended by everything. Now you said too much on this topic. Oh, you said too little on this topic. They're offended by everything. It, it, it seems like all we do in this culture, just consciously, selfishly uh, uh, offended by everything does, and the danger is when we bring that into the church, when we bring that into this place, man, we are damaging far more than we ever thought. We are crippling our ability to go out there and engage in combat. You know, think about people in war, you know, they, they go to the medic. You know, they're, they're expecting to get fixed. They want to go back out there and fight. They want to go out there with their brothers. They didn't, even, they didn't want to come in the first place, but they had to to be effective out there to actually cover their brother's back. They had to get fixed up, and yet they come here, and they get beat up even more. And they don't get the nourishment that they need. They don't get you know, what, they, what they want, what, what is they're desperate for, so they can engage in the combat again. You know, the guys, that, that's an issue. That when we bring that mindset into the church where we are selfish, where we are self-absorbed, we're offended by every little thing, we're never going to accomplish God's mission. So this idea that love covers a multitude of sins, this idea that he's essentially saying it's time to put our differences aside. If you like pineapple on your pizza, whatever. (laughs) I still love you. Actually, I'm the one that likes pineapple on the pizza, so don't judge. So we, we need to put these little hurts and these irritations and these struggles away. Get over it. We got 99 problems, but eternity is not one. Remember these things that are important. Remember the, the mission we've been called to. Love covers a multitude of sins. Let's reconnect for the mission. Really, uh, th- just, just for a moment again, if you, wherever you guys are, if you're hearing this, if there's people in your life, there's just friction. You don't know what it is. There's friction. There's, there's hurt. I encourage you guys. I, I, I'm asking you. I'm begging you. Seek them out. Seek them out. And you don't come to them and say, you did all these things, you know what, but I forgive you. <laughs> no, just seek them out. Love them. Maybe start praying for them right now. You know, that God would change your heart. That he help you get over it. And you may never bring it up. But seek them out, guys. Seek to be restored. So I, I, I think we would agree. Th- this has been a very difficult year. <laughs> right? It has. I mean, so many. We got natural disasters. Human disasters. Chaos. Hatred. Bloodshed. It's just been a, a difficult year, but it, I have tried to remain hope, and I'm just so thankful that there are still stories of people rising to the occasion and loving others, of self-sacrificing, serving. Now, they don't get all the publicity and the media attention, but they're out there. They're faithful to do that. Again, Sometimes we're tempted to think that we're the only ones. We're not. 
God is using people all over the world on 2020 to do wonderful things, to serve others, to bless others, to show up and help rebuild the house. And the person was there who was, was not expecting the church to show up, in fact, they had bet that they probably wouldn't. And yet they did. And that story, by and large, is unheard of. Only a few of us know what, I, what I'm even referring to. And there's so many other things like this where we're, we're doing wonderful things. And, and just our, our faith in Christianity and divine humanity is, is restored. And, and I think there's a lot to be encouraged by. I, I, I love, I love the, this, I forgot where it's from. Is it A Tale of Two Cities? Or it's just uh, the, oh, I'm blanking now. It wasn't in my notes, but just where, where there's greatest tragedy and problems, there's also the greatest opportunity. I think that's coming from Tale of Two Cities, somewhere paraphrased. So there's amazing stories that, that people are just getting glimpses of it. And I'm asking you guys to look for those places, those people in your context where you can cover a lot of with, with love. One of the things that, that's been frustrating, though, they, we, we look at our, our, our I'm just kind of rambling a little bit more. Let me, let me continue, though. You look, you look for these good stories of, of people putting aside their differences. And you look for these stories of people loving others and covering a multitude of sins. And sometimes you really hope that, it, that it's going to come from our, nas- our nation's leaders, don't we? We hope that it comes from them. But y- you don't see that in our national politicians. Now, I- in the midst of these human tragedies, you see politicians racing to just turn it into some kind of political agenda. It's a way to cast shade on the other side. And that's what you see. Instead of, I, mean, I remember uh, 9-11, you know, the, the, the politicians, man, they showed up and they sang God bless America. They were there helping, serving, lifting rubble, just trying to, ch- politicians, white collar jobs, in there getting their hands dirty. You don't see that that often. Again, you just see them capitalizing on these tragedies to, to, to twist it and manipulate it. And I only mention that yeah, we are, are in, a, I guess, a political season, but I, I mention it because I want to remind us all that our hope is not found in Washington, D.C. Hope for this nation, hope for our family, hope for all of, all of mankind is not found in politics. It's not. Guys, if we want something different, we need to get out there and start something different. It's going to come from grassroots movements. At the f- and, and at the forefront of these people demanding change, and that's not again even demanding change, but being the change, the church should be in the forefront. We should be. We should be that. Again, not just demanding change in others, but being the change ourselves. We're not contributing to the hate. We're not contributing to the anger. We're not contributing to the slander. We're not, we're not participating in, in, in the ridiculous, if you want to call them debates, where I really I'm just trying to... Instead, though, we ought to be rolling up our sleeves, getting in the mix, and genuinely seeking to make a difference in those people God has put in our life. I don't think there's any responsibility or even backlash if you don't reach the people and make a difference in the people in my life. (laughs) But there is responsibility, and there will be judgment if you did nothing to reach the people in your life. God has put them in your life, not mine, for you to do something, to make a difference, to respond in all these ways, to follow the script that that Peter has been given us. And there's a sense of urgency in this. In, In order for that to happen, it needs to start in the church as we love one another, as we seek to listen to one another rather than being heard, And then we unite and put our differences aside to complete this mission. And Peter didn't begin to to, to define love further in verse 9. He says, be hospitable to one another without complaint. 
as each one of us has received a special gift. Now, I, lo- I like the idea of calling here better. We've received a calling, each one of us. A- a- a news flash, guys, your calling is not necessarily my calling. It doesn't unite the team when you start saying, everybody, you should be doing my calling. How come you're not doing my calling? <laughs> it doesn't unite the team. We all have our own. And it says we should be employing it in the serving of one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Whoever speaks is to do so as one who is speaking the utterances of God. Man, this gives me just goosebumps and that's heavy. Whoever serves is to do so as one who who is serving by the strength which God supplies. So that in all things, God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belongs the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. In essence, guys, we've all received a calling. Everybody say it with me. I received a calling. All right, that was, that was all right. I'll say it like you mean it. I have received a calling. Just like, like what, what you're talking about, like that song. You know, we're not, we're not singing it and requesting it. It's true. I'm declaring it. If you are in Christ, if you have the Holy Spirit in you, it's the same Holy Spirit I have. It's the same Holy Spirit Peter had. You have a calling. Just like Peter had, just like I have. doesn't matter how old you are. So in essence, we have all received a calling, and we need to be faithful to our calling. And then that's whether it's up front or it's behind the scenes. All for the glory of Christ. These, these, these verses remind me that our mission statement is, is spot on. I love it. And I, I only had a little bit to do with it. Other, other better thinkers put this together. This is this, but it was, we put this together. To, and it, it just, man, to be an intentional and authentic body of believers seeking to have every part of our daily lives glorify God. And be transformed by the extraordinary teachings and gospel of Jesus Christ. Committed to making disciples of all people at every opportunity. There's urgency in that. You want to be on mission? You want to to complete this, your part? You have to be intentional about it. You've got to be genuine. At every opportunity, seeking to make disciples. I mean, there's urgency in that. So that's exactly what Peter is saying. Peter is saying that we need to arm ourselves with this mindset. Remember a few weeks ago we talked about put the game face on. We're just "Ah, just going with life. Game face. Everybody do that. No, don't do that. (laughs) We've got to realize if we're going to follow Christ in 2020, in Columbia, Kentucky, or wherever you you find yourself, You've wasted enough of your time living for yourself. You've wasted enough pursuing the things that don't really matter. Let's not waste another day. Let, let, let's be intentional. Let's, let, let's choose rightly. Let's represent the gospel in our workplace. And who cares what we've done already? You can't get the past back. Some of you guys have blown it and you're thinking, oh man, I can't make a, I can't clean up this mess. No, you can't. Jesus can. It doesn't matter what you've done in your workplace. Jesus can fix it. You just need to decide, are you going to be a part of that fix? Or are you going to keep hindering it? And the people around us, they, they may not understand, they may not appreciate it. If we choose this path of righteousness, though, it's going to shed light on things. We have a responsibility to be faithful stewards of this gospel so that God can shine light in a dark world. Right now, October 11th, let me just try and illustrate this as I wrap up. October 11th, this very day, there are people you know, people you work with, people living next door. People who go to school with you, people you're going to interact with today who are lost. They, are, they are, are, are just miserable. They're empty. They're desperate. They're, 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 they're trying everything that the world offers, trying to satisfy what their soul 
hungers for most. They're trying and they're moving on to one thing, to the next thing, to the next thing. Believing the lie that this will satisfy. No, it didn't. This will satisfy and it just costs them more and more and more until they're finally, they're just, they're hopeless. And, the, and they may be putting on a happy face, but on inside they are probably just desperate wondering, is, this, is life even worth living? If you really, if they were self-aware, and <laughs> that's probably what they're thinking. Is life even worth it? Well, you are going to interact with them today. You're going to see them. You're going to interact. You're going you're to rub shoulders with them six feet, away, six feet apart this week. Just imagine now that all these people that we are going to come into contact, think about how many people you regularly come into contact now and then just multiply that by whoever is listening here, whoever is in this room. Think about, what if we got serious? And we, we stepped over into this I'm on mission calling. We stepped out of our comfort zone, just trying to be a Christian, not blow it, into a I'm on mission. This time is of the essence. This, there's some urgency. And we, and we started interacting with them that way. I think, I think, I, I, I faithfully, I, I am confident that by this time next year, Many of those people would be sitting here with us, full of hope, full of joy, because they being redeemed by the, by, the, by the blood, the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus Christ. If we would just get intentional and be part of this mission, I'm excited for that. I can see it. It's like the Lord's saying, like, like just do your part, I'll do mine. The Lord, he's been saying that for all, your whole life, as long as you've been a Christian. Just do your part, I'll do mine. You follow the script that I've written. You do the things that, that I've told Peter to tell you to do. I'm going to save souls. Jesus was always in, in, in the Father's business, wasn't he? And the Father's business is seeking to establish and reestablish people with him. Giving us access into this, this wonderful holy of holies through the blood of Jesus Christ. And if, and if Jesus' life is in us, shouldn't we expect that we would be doing the same type of business? Let's get serious about it. I, mean, I'm, 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 I think a, a year from now, people from your school, people from your workplace, people that you just meet in the community can be right here with us, worshiping God together, fulfilling their calling in the lives of the people God has put in their life. Let's pray. Father God, we need help. We cannot do this on our own, but you can do it. Lord, we thank you for the hope that we have in you. Lord, I thank you that, as I've shared this, Lord, that I know I, I'm confident your spirit is at work, stirring in us and giving us, some of us, a desire to be on mission and to step into the next, whatever it is you have for them. Lord, I ask God that your spirit would help them, would encourage them, give them the faith and the courage to just to be obedient to this, this calling you're, you're, you're placing on them. I ask, Lord, that you would, you would tell us, that your spirit would tell somebody of what is going on. And lead us to, to, to step out and, and, and encourage that person as well. Lord, use us as, as a body to encourage one another, to help one another, to heal one another, and to be united on this mission for your glory. Lord, unite us. And show us where, show us how and where. Lord, we love you. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Mu the musicians are going to come up now. And they're going to lead us in another song. And again, I, I want you to think about these, these lyrics. And, and really just pray them, but also just, just be comforted in these. That, that, that it, it is, there's a calling we have, but the, the ability and the strength to accomplish it is not ours. It doesn't have to be ours. We're not winning a battle per se where we get out and arm wrestle people, but we're, we're, we're just being obedient and we're saying, Lord, here we are. Have your way with us. 
And that strength, He will supply. He will give it to us. So let's sing this and just respond. And again, if God is calling you, if He's stirring in you, I really, I pray that you, that you would respond to Him. But maybe share it with somebody. Tell somebody. God is, God, is, God is calling me to something more. I don't know what it is, maybe. But you've got to tell somebody. And let us help you. Let us be a part of this with you. All right, let's, let's sing.
this out just so it's it's official. Um, <laughs> you guys are welcome to, to hang out. I encourage you guys to hang out, to chat, get to know somebody, encourage somebody. Um, but our but our planned somewhat official gathering um, is is come to an end. So everybody, again on Facebook, you're still with us. We love you. We're praying for you. Can't wait to see you. Uh, everyone here, may the Lord bless you, keep you, make His face shine upon you. And again, if there is somebody, the Lord is stirring in you. I believe it is. I mean, it's me for sure. Um, t- tell somebody. Share what God is doing in your life right now. Before you leave, don't go through those doors without talking to somebody and asking for prayer and just sharing, this is what God is speaking to me and shining light on. So, love you guys. I think the Lord is doing good things right now. And it's awesome to see. Thanks for joining us.